Hi, I'm Chin Lu. And I'm Sal. And this is our next make. Our mailbox is really starting to show its age. Not only does it have to endure severe weather, but every winter when the plows come down the hill, it really gets slammed with a ton of snow. And over the years, we've done several repairs, but it's time for us to make a new one. So I jumped into SolidWorks for Makers to quickly model a few variations of the new mailbox. I also made a basic dimension drawing that we could show to our local post office and get approval. Then I used Make By Me to work out the new design in more detail. This free software from Dassault System allows you to design all sorts of wooden projects. There's a library of standard materials that help you get started really quickly. I'm overlapping the boards since we're not sure the type of joints we plan to use. This will ensure we have the right amount of materials to work with later. The way that parts just snap together when you drag them around is so satisfying. Here, I'm laying out three frames for the planter box. It'll be covered in plywood and shingles. But right now, I'm just focusing on the 2x4 pieces so I can get an accurate materials list. I'm also modeling the mailbox post. It just feels right to see a saw blade as I trim the digital representation of the 4x4. Once I'm happy with the design, I take a look at the plans, which include the materials list so I know how much to buy, a cut list so I know how long to cut each piece, and cut diagrams so I can reduce scrap and efficiently nest shorter parts into one 8-foot board. This is all the material we're going to need for the project. We have pressure treated 2x4s and plywood for the planter box, cedar posts and shingles, as well as PVC trim. Let's start by breaking down the 2x4s for the planter box frame. This project is going to use half-lap joinery, which means we need to remove half the thickness of the material on both of these pieces. Now there's many ways to do this, but I like to do it here at the table saw. And the first thing we have to do is dial in the exact height of our table saw blade. I make a cut on either side of the board with the saw blade intentionally set lower than half the board thickness. This leaves a small tenon on the piece. Then I raise the blade a tiny bit and make cuts on both sides again. I repeat this process until the last bit of the tenon is whisked away. Now that the height of the blade is dialed in, we need to figure out how to remove the perfect amount of material for the width of the half lap. Now we could just mark a line here and try and cut to it, but I like to use the rip fence as a gauge. One way to do this is to place the material up to the outside of your saw blade and then bring another piece just to the inside up against the wood and slide your fence over to meet that and lock it down. Now what that does is creates a perfect amount of material to remove, which is the same as the board. The other way to do this is to bring your material to the inside of the blade and slide your rip fence in place. Now if I were to use the fence as my gauge, I would end up removing too much material. So I'm going to need a spacer that's the same thickness as my saw blade, which is conveniently an eighth of an inch. So I'll use an eighth inch drill bit to gauge where to stop cutting. I find that this technique works well, but it can be slow going with a single blade. So I set up my data blades to work on the 2x4 half laps. Using the dado blade creates great results, but it did take a little bit of time to get these two done. And we have a lot of pieces to make, so we're gonna change techniques. We're gonna make the shoulder cut here at the table saw, and I've set up a spacer so that we can register against it and get repeatable cuts. I used the first piece that we cut with the dado blades to position the fence on the bandsaw and install a stop block so I could make repeatable cheek cuts. This setup made everything go much faster. To assemble the three frames that make up the majority of the planter box structure, we wet one side of the half lap joint and then spread Gorilla Glue on the mating piece. After checking for square, I drove in a few screws. This glue reacts with the wetness of the other board and creates an expanding foam bond. Excess is easily cut off with a utility knife. We drive three inch screws up through the bottom frame to hold the two side frames in place and then install the two top spacer pieces on the short sides. With the frame complete, we cut half-inch pressure-treated plywood to size and attach it with short exterior screws. Then we start working on the trim. We're using PVC because it stands up well to the elements, and we're building corner assemblies before attaching them to the box, which we do with galvanized nails. Sal would stop shy of hitting the PVC, and I'd fully seat the nails using a nail set. We installed the bottom trim the same way and fill the nail holes with paintable caulk. The top trim on the planter box goes together like a picture frame. 
I miter the corners and hold them together with pocket screws. We paint the trim at this point because it's much easier to do before the shingles are installed. And we coat the shingles with a solid stain. It took a bit of time to stain enough to cover all four sides. If you're installing cedar shingles on a permanent structure like a house or a garage, you'll want to install a vapor barrier as well as a breathable mesh. But for this simple planter box, we're going to install the shingles directly on the pressure treated plywood. To make sure that water sheds away from the planter box, I've already beveled the top of this piece of molding to 15 degrees. Now, when I place my first shingle, instead of butting it directly up against the bottom, I'm going to raise it up about a quarter of an inch. When I place my second shingle, instead of butting it directly up against this one, I'm going to leave a small gap. Now you can either eyeball it, or you can use a nail as a spacer if you want. This small gap will let the shingles expand when they get wet. When I install my second row of shingles, instead of lining it up with the previous row, I want to bring it down so there's just a small air gap between it and the molding. That way any water that comes down here and wants to travel inward will drop off the back instead of continuing to migrate. Once it hits here, it'll roll forward. To install the next rows, I first tack a straight board in place and then carefully align a row of shingles on it, making sure that the nails as well as the gaps from the previous row are covered. At the top of the box, I install a thin piece of PVC molding and then cut off the overhanging shingles. Now I can start working on the mailbox post. I cut the long vertical and horizontal pieces to length and chamfer the ends to add a bit of visual interest. Then I miter both ends of the short gusset piece. To create the notches in the post, I'm going to use a router with a half inch bit and a 5 8 inch bushing. Now because there's a difference in size, I need to compensate for that in my setup. I've got a straight edge clamped to the post already, but if I were to just take my stock and use it to set the other straight edge, I'd end up cutting a notch that's an eighth inch too narrow. So I need to add a few spacers, and I found that eight index cards will create a sixteenth of an inch gap. I'll add a stack to each side to compensate for the bushing, and then start routing. I'm using a really powerful router here because there's so much material to remove, but I'm still taking my time and using three passes to cut the full depth. If you have a less powerful router, check out our chicken coop episode to see how we created notches with a circular saw and trim router. The post goes together with some more Gorilla Glue and a few structural wood screws. This time, I'm a bit more careful with the glue so I can minimize how much foam there will be to clean up afterwards. We clamp the post in place and check for square. Then we attach it to the planter box using a few more structural wood screws. Now we can shingle the back of the planter just like we did the other sides. I'm installing a layer of landscape fabric as an extra layer of protection between the soil and the pressure treated lumber. This will create an air gap between the two and hopefully extend the life of this project. Chin Lu thinks this is overkill, but I carry on anyway and hold it in place with galvanized staples. We wrap up the planter by installing the top trim. This covers the edge of the landscape fabric and makes for a finished look. Then we start working on the mailbox. The idea is that the front of the mailbox will hang from a chain and be free to pivot around a sort of ball joint at the back. We attach an eye bolt to the back of the mailbox beam and then drill holes in the top of the mailbox for a U-bolt. This will hold the chain to the mailbox. To create a waterproof seal, we cut a small gasket from a scrap of L200 foam and sandwich it between the mailbox and the U-bolt retainer. We screw the eye bolt to the post using a U-shaped bracket. This is what allows the mailbox to pivot. We use the same bracket to attach the chain to the top of the post. And that completes the build. So we have to test it out. And it works. Now on to installing it in the front yard. We start by saving a few of the plants from the old planter. Then we use a crowbar and a bit of sweat to remove all of the old material. After we regrade the area, we add a few inches of crushed stone and tamp it down to create a nice level pad. We position the mailbox six inches back from our little pull off from the side of the road and then fill it with soil and add back some greenery. I'm really happy with the results of this project and I can't wait to see how this design stands up against the snow from the plows. Thank you for watching. We'll see you on our next make.